thank you, Sister. Thank you, everyone. My dear brother bishops, I'm honored that you're here. My dear brother priests and deacons, fellow religious, sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ. I'm deeply grateful to, for the hospitality of the American Bible Society. It's, uh, I re I'm old enough to remember the days when we Catholics might not be part of this wonderful group. And it's a, it's a wonderful experience of hospitality and the presence of the risen Christ in the church today. So we're grateful for that. I'm grateful to the Crossroads Cultural Center for the invitation to be with you today. Uh, my uh, the title of my address is Thoughts on the Mission of St. Paul. Uh, Father Peter John, I'm very happy to be a companion with you on the way that leads to Jesus who died and was risen from the dead. Your presentation was very creative and fresh and we're all grateful for it. So the title of my thought is Thoughts on the Mission of St. Paul. To start with the obvious, a really thorough discussion of St. Paul's mission, which is my theme today, would keep us here for a week. And then I'd never get invited back. <laughs> and I love New York, so I want to be invited back. So, in speaking about Paul and the challenges that he faced, I'll focus instead on one key question that my friend, Mario Paredes, suggested as a talking point. What lessons can we learn from Paul about our own mission as Christians in today's society? It's a good question. Here's my answer. Very much like ourselves, St. Paul lived in complex times. Rome was the dominant superpower of the day, but the Pax Romana was a great deal messier and bloodier than our history books sometimes suggest. Yet Paul responded so well to the demands of his time because he had two extraordinary gifts. And we can cultivate those same gifts in ourselves today. First, Paul was a man of his world in the best sense. He was educated, skilled, and cosmopolitan. Unlike most Jews, he was also a Roman citizen. While he was rigorous in maintaining his Jewish identity, he also valued Roman learning and Roman law. From the perspective of our 21st century, he really was a man for all seasons. But Paul was also a man of his own season. In other words, he was a man with a keen grasp of his cultural circumstances, a man with a shrewd understanding of his own people, of wider Roman society, and of the yearnings of the Mediterranean world. Secondly, Paul was a man who deliberately and zealously committed himself to pursuing the truth. And he was prepared to pay, as he finally did, the ultimate price in pursuing that truth, his own martyrdom. Paul proclaimed his faith in season and out of season. He was always ready to convince, rebuke, exhort, and be unfailing in patience and in teaching. He was willing to fight the good fight. He also had no fear of consequences because when we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become as the scum of the world, the dredge of all things, even till now. Paul was a determined man. As even St. Peter discovered, Paul never let shallow courtesies interfere with his witness for Jesus Christ. In fact, by today's standards, Paul's passion for Jesus borders on the unseemly. But of course, that says more about us than about him. Now, why would Paul go to such extremes? There's a simple reason, and you've heard it already today. Paul not only knew the truth as a collection of doctrines, he was possessed by the God of truth who gives us life in Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. 
Because of this, he could write, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. St. Augustine once summarized Paul's personality with this powerful phrase, Cor Paoli, Cor Christi. The heart of Paul is the heart of Christ. And of course, he was right. There has never been, and there will never be, a greater missionary of Jesus than St. Paul. Through Paul, the gospel of Jesus reached the world. And our job as believers today is to be Paul once again to the world around us. So starting with these two Pauline qualities, his keen sense of his times and his intense zeal for the truth that is Jesus, I'd like to make two simple points that may help us live out the example of St. Paul's mission in our own lives. Here's the first point. If we're serious when we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, then we need to understand our own times as well as Paul did his. That's a lot easier said than done. Here's why. The tools we rely on to inform us are the same tools we use to delude ourselves about the real world. The American news and entertainment media, which now so often overlap, are the largest catechetical syndicate in history. They teach us how to think and what to think. But the culture they've helped create, a culture based on immediacy, brevity, visual stimulation, celebrity, and self-absorption, is very different from anything in our country's past. And that has a big implication, not just for our democratic public life, but for the Christian's place in American society. We can't really know our times until we first know how our mass media work, and especially how they work on us. A drunk can't get sober until he stops drinking. It's a good lesson to remember when we switch on the evening news. Obviously, we can't turn our back on TV, the internet, and all the imp other information technologies that crowd into our lives. But we can learn to judge them soberly and critically. <clears throat> and if we don't, the consequences may be very unhappy. The America founding and all of our democratic institutions come from print-based patterns of thought. America is the child of book literacy, critical reasoning, and one other key factor that I'll turn to in a moment. My point is this. The more sensory, immediate, and emotional our culture becomes, the farther it gets from the habits of serious thought that sustain its ideals. And yet that's exactly what our mass media promote. Their profits depend on creating a constant spirit of urgency and change in their audience, a constant illusion of needs that demand our attention. Now what's the result? We become restless and stupid. It's tempting to blame the media too harshly for this dumbing down of American life. There's plenty of fair criticism we can point in their direction. But mainly, we've done this to ourselves. If you take home just one suggestion from our time together tonight, let it be this. Get a copy of Daniel Borston's book, The Image or What Happened to the American Dream and read it, and then think about it with your computer, your television, and your iPod turned off. 